the message for the morning is a picture of grace. And the scripture text is in Zechariah chapter 3, reading verses 1 and following. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And he said unto him, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt also keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. I can never forget my first Bible. I was about five or six years of age when I received it. It was a blue Bible, a hardback, different from everyone else's Bible in the church. I could always recognize which one was mine when I was just a boy of five or six. The first page of the Bible read to Michael, May God bless you, son. Love, daddy, and mama. And it was a different Bible than the Bible that my dad carried to church. And it was different than the Bible that my mom carried to church, but I didn't mind. Because my Bible had pictures. I would sit on the pew quietly while the preacher was preaching, and I would look at the pictures. And I still remember them vividly today. I remember the picture of the earth when it was without form and void. It was a dark scene. Clouds were dark. And it was a scene of choppy waves on the ocean. And it looked frightening and ominous to me. Then I remember the scene of the Garden of Eden with all of the animals and light shining. I remember the picture of Adam and Eve standing there behind some big leaves, <laughs> wondering why they didn't have any clothes on. I was just a boy of five or six, you have to remember. And I remember the next picture of Eve standing with an apple in her hand and a snake in a tree. And I thought, whatever she's about to do is not good. It was a sinister looking picture. Remember the picture of Noah and the ark with all of the animals? The animals going up that big plank into the ark. I remember the picture of Jonah in the sea and a whale about to swallow him. I remember the picture of Elijah from that Bible <clears throat> when two ravens came as he sat by a little brook. One of them had a small loaf of bread in its mouth. The other one had what looked like a piece of beef jerky. And ever since that time, ever the time I read the story of Elijah being fed flesh by the ravens, I think that they probably brought him beef jerky. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the picture of uh, Daniel sitting quietly among the placid lions at peace because God had protected him. And I remember the picture in that Bible of the three Hebrew children walking in the fire and the appearance of an angel as it were walking with them. Those pictures made a profound impression on me. I could look at them. In fact, I could look at them today. When I go to the doctor's office sometimes and find one of those hardback children's Bibles. You've seen them. They're brown, most of them. I, I like to go through there and look at the pictures. 
I'll never forget how disappointed I was when Daddy told me that you're going to get a real Bible. When I turned about 9 or 10, and then I thought, okay, I'm ready for a real Bible. If the pictures in the child's Bible are these, this great, the pictures in the real Bible must be really good. And I'll never forget how disappointed I was when I opened my real Bible and there weren't any pictures except in the very back and there were a few maps, but those were of little interest to me. Most of us do better with pictures, don't we? We like pictures. It's much easier for us to watch a picture show and to enjoy that than it is to pick up a book and to read it because we don't have to work quite as hard when the pictures are already there. And I'm thankful that even though the gospel is a message that God has given to be proclaimed, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching, not pictures, to save them that believe. God didn't call artists to depict the gospel. He called men to proclaim the good news. And even though that is the ordinary means of feeding the sheep and promoting the good news to the glory of God, yet I'm thankful that in the Bible there are some illustrations of great Bible truths. And this morning in the third chapter of Zechariah, the passage I've read in your hearing, what we have here is a picture of grace. Is there a sweeter word in the English language than the word grace? I can't think of one. For those who have been taught by the Holy Spirit that they are sinners, the word grace is indeed gospel, good news. Grace speaks of unmerited favor bestowed upon undeserving and hell-deserving recipients. Grace is God stooping to help the helpless. God condescending to our lowest state. Grace is God blessing you when you don't deserve it. It is God's kindness to us in spite of ourselves. Grace is the key word in the gospel. It's a gospel of grace. Paul said, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace. The Lord Jesus Christ is said to be full of grace and truth. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of grace and supplications. Grace is a joyful sound to sensible sinners. And I love to hear about grace. It's amazing, isn't it? John Newton did not exaggerate when he wrote that hymn, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. My friends, if you have ever learned that you deserve hell, and that God blessed you with eternal life when you deserved eternal judgment, you too will have to say it's amazing. Grace is amazing. Wonderful grace of Jesus, the other hymn writer says. And it is wonderful. Yes, my friends, we love to hear about grace. I love to preach about grace. There's no higher privilege and joy in my life as a gospel minister than to proclaim the message of grace. I love to tell about what God did before the foundation of the world, what Christ did on the cross, what the Holy Spirit does in the hearts of His people. I love to tell how God planned it, Christ executed it, the Holy Spirit applies it, and one day the Lord Himself will consummate it so that from start to finish, it's a work of grace. When the headstone is brought into the building that God has built, if you please, the superstructure of a family, when the headstone is placed, the shouting will go up as Zechariah 4, 6 says, Grace, grace unto it. You know, the shout will not be works, works. <laughs> it will not be free will, free will. It will not be man's effort, man's goodness, man's inherent divinity. No, the, the, the shout in heaven will be grace, grace. Everybody that is in heaven is there because of grace. There will be nobody in heaven there because there were such good people. When you understand the doctrine of total gravity, you know there aren't any good people. They're all hell-deserving people. Everybody is a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, says Romans chapter 6, verse 23. 
And therefore, grace is the only hope for sinners. It's, this is the only message that will suit the sinner's case. I love to proclaim the message of grace. But what I want to do this morning is show you a picture. A picture that was painted not by Michelangelo or Da Vinci or not by some great artist in history, but a picture that was painted by the Holy Spirit of God. It's a picture of grace. The first thing we see in this picture in Zechariah chapter 3 is a frightening prospect. Listen to the first verse. And he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. This is a picture of judgment. Even though the word judgment does not appear in verse 1, it's obviously the scene of a person on trial. The word resist in the text, if you have a marginal reference in your Bible, you may see that that word is flagged and the marginal reading says to prosecute him. Satan standing at his right hand to prosecute him. I have some good preacher friends who are prosecuting attorneys. Elder Tim McCool in the state of Alabama is a county prosecutor. Elder Chris Taylor in Bureau Beach, Florida is also a prosecuting attorney. Elder John Melvin in the Atlanta metro region is a prosecutor. I've always thought if a primitive Baptist was going to be an attorney, that would be a good job to have and try to put away the bad guys. <laughs> to prosecute instead of to defend people by parsing words. And, but anyway, I guess there's a place for defense attorneys too, especially if you're the one who's been accused if you're on trial. But um, Satan is the prosecutor. The devil is the prosecutor in this verse. He's the one who is bringing a case against Joshua the high priest. Now the Joshua in this verse is not the Joshua that you read about earlier in the Old Testament that went into the Promised Land. That's Joshua the son of Nun. Joshua and Caleb. This is Joshua who was the high priest. He's a religious person. He's not just a priest, but he's the high priest. And only one person could fill that role in the nation of Israel at a time. He, the high priest, had the privilege of going into the Holy of Holies and meeting God on the Day of Atonement every year. And his was a very important and a very reputable position. So what we have here is not some bum off the streets or some criminal with a checkered past. But what we have here is a man who's very religious, who is <coughs> who makes spirituality his occupation in life, if you please. You expect preachers to be holy, don't you? And uh, Joshua the high priest was no exception. Notice the picture here then is not of a sorry excuse for a human being, but of a, an upstanding, moral, righteous individual, and he is on trial. By the way, did you know no matter what a person's occupation in life is, whether he's a preacher or whether he's a shoeshiner, whether he is a president or whether he is a street sweeper, whether a farmer or a teacher or a doctor or a homemaker or an attorney or whatever your job might be, all of us face a frightening prospect of standing before God in judgment one day. I would like to uh, win friends and influence people and say that, uh, oh, it's all okay, you're never going to be accountable for your sins, but I wouldn't be true to the Scriptures if I said that. The truth of the Scriptures is that every work will be brought into judgment someday. Does that, is that frightening to you? It, it, it is a bit frightening to me to think about the judgment day. Now, there have been preachers who have capitalized on the frightening prospect of a final judgment for years to scare God's little children. I like the way old-timers used to preach. 
Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1, they said it didn't say, Scare ye, scare ye, my people, but he said, Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. The gospel is not a message of fear, but of comfort, a message of peace. Faith does not work by fear. You want to you want people to trust God and serve God and live a life of faith, the best way to motivate them is not by fear, but faith works by love, says the book of Galatians. Help the Lord's people fall in love with their Savior. If your love has grown cold to Jesus Christ this morning, dear friends, I hope this message will help you to fall in love with Him all over again. He is altogether lovely. The fact is, absence doesn't make the heart grow fonder. When you haven't talked to somebody in a long time, you haven't heard from them, you haven't seen any pictures, do you know what happens? Necessarily, we uh, our hearts grow cold to the people, and then when we see them again, we always say, I've forgotten how much fun I have when I'm around you. I've forgotten how much I enjoy your company. Oh, I love you. I hope our paths will cross again real soon. You know, that's the benefit of fellowship. Well, the same is true for the Lord Jesus Christ and our love for Him. It is as we are reminded of who He is, as we see pictures of Him in the gospel as it's preached. It's when we come to the house of God and hear songs about Jesus and we are around the people of God that we fall in love with Him all over again. And it's the love of Christ that constraineth us. Faith works by love. Now, in our text... He speaks of Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and the prosecuting attorney is standing at his right hand laying charges against him. And this speaks of a frightening prospect, the frightening prospect of final judgment. It is a fact, dear friends, that one day the Lord will sit on the great white throne and before him shall be gathered all nations. The grand assize is coming. We sing the song sometimes, When thou, my righteous judge, shall come to fetch thy ransomed people home, shall I among them stand? The songwriter asks the question, Will I be numbered among your people? Shall such a worthless worm as I, who sometimes am afraid to die, be found at thy right hand? And the hymn writer asks the question that all of us ask, What will happen at that last judgment? Now a lot of preachers use the fact of the final and general judgment to scare people. <clears throat> and it is frightening. But I'm not trying to scare you with it today. In fact, I venture to say that you and I have reason to face that judgment with boldness and confidence, not with fear. I'll tell you why in just a moment. You don't have to be afraid of the final judgment. I'll tell you the reason that that's true in just a moment. I do want you to listen to this verse, though, in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, where the apostle says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. I've often heard people say there's nothing worse than death. You ever heard that? Death is a frightening prospect in and of itself. It's appointed unto men once to die. You say, oh, I want to do everything I can to avoid death. I want to try to hold it at bay as long as possible. Death is coming. Someone says there's nothing worse than death, but notice that text gets worse. <laughs> as it is appointed unto men once to die, you say, well, that's, boy, that sounds very frightening, preacher. And then after that, the judgment. That's more frightening yet. The next verse says, so Christ was once on bear the sins of many. I'm glad that the Holy Spirit did not stop the ninth chapter of Hebrews with verse 27. As it was appointed unto men once to die, and after this the judgment, period, because all of us would have reason to tremble. You remember when Paul preached to Felix in Acts chapter uh, 26 perhaps it is? When he preached to Felix, it says he preached to him of of righteousness and temperance and judgment to come, and Felix trembled. You know what Paul was telling Felix? He was telling him that God holds every man accountable. Every person is answerable to God. There's none of us who are going to get a free pass. 
you're going to have to answer to God. I'm going to have to answer to God for the way that we've lived. You say, well, preacher, that scares me. You see, what we see in our text is a frightening prospect. Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord, and the prosecutor is there with his case prepared. Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Do you think that the devil would have anything to charge you with? Have you committed any sins? Have you yielded to any temptations in your life? Have you been overcome by the old serpent? Have you yielded to the flesh before in your life? I dare say the devil has an airtight case to convict me. I think he has plenty of evidence that I'm a sinner and that you're a sinner to convict you before a holy God. Notice after he talks about a frightening prospect in this, this picture of grace, we have secondly a serious problem in verse number 3. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. Now, I've been told that when you show up to court, you better wear the nicest clothes you have. Even the worst criminal, if he has an attorney, will, te will tell him that you don't wear jeans <coughs> and, and a short sleeve shirt that shows all of your tattoos, and you take out your piercings, and, and you don't look like you just woke up. You comb your hair, and you wash your face, because uh, you, want to, you want to be dressed at least as a citizen, as a civil human being when you go to court. I want you to notice on this occasion, Joshua the high priest, when he stands before the angel of the Lord and the prosecuting attorney is there with his case against Joshua, Joshua is clothed, it says, with filthy garments. And he stood before the angel. If verse 1 referred to the judgment that faces all of us, verse number 3 talks about the depravity with which we come before judgment. Now you said, preacher, I thought you were going to preach a, give us a picture of grace this morning. Well, I am, but before you can see the beautiful jewel of grace, you have to see the dark background of depravity. Before we can truly appreciate the gift that God has given us, we must understand the plight that we were in by nature. We must understand the, uh, the backdrop of our own corruption. Joshua was clothed with filthy garments. The message of grace, in other words, starts with an emphasis on man's inherent depravity. Now, some people preach that people are basically good, that everybody has a spark of divinity, that man is really godlike. And the spark just needs to be fanned into a full roaring fire uh, of, uh, of, of goodness, that, man, that people are essentially good. Well, the Bible message is the diametric opposite of that. The Bible says that man is not essentially good, but he is fundamentally and thoroughly flawed and corrupt. Listen to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. There is none righteous, there is none that seeketh after God. There is none that understandeth. He says, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. In uncertain unequivocal terms. In certain unequivocal terms, the Apostle Paul writes by divine inspiration here that man is vile, he's not righteous. Now, preachers have been known to exaggerate. And someone reads that when Paul says there is none righteous, no, not one, and they say he must have been exaggerating. Surely he's, he's using hyperbole. He's going above the limits of protocol, and there, there probably are some good people. He says, no, not one. There's none good, no, not one. Lest we should misunderstand what he's saying, he emphasizes it, no, not one. So maybe you ask today, what about some of the great men who've lived in human history? What about some of these great philosophers? Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and Rousseau and these smart men in the past? What about Immanuel Kant? And David Hume, and what about Hegel? I'm telling you, none were good. All were sinners. He said, well, what about some of these scientists? What about Einstein or Edison? Or what about uh, Dr. Werner von Braun? Or what about, uh, what about uh, Louis Pasteur? Or what about uh, Galileo? These men were 
a cut above the rest. They weren't just common like we are. They seemed to be almost divine. I'm telling you they were sinners by nature and by choice. Someone says, well, what about the religious people? What about Moses and Abraham? Did you know the same Bible that tells us that these people were people who served God and were true children of God, yet the same Bible tells us about the sins, the darkest moments in their lives. The same Bible that tells us that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord records Noah's drunkenness. The same Bible that tells us about Moses' faithfulness to God records Moses' anger when he smote the rock and God said, speak to it. The same Bible that tells us about Abraham's faith tells us about Abraham's doubt, his laughter when God asked, is anything too hard for the Lord? The same Bible that tells us about uh, about, uh, about the righteousness of the saints tells us about the sins of the saints. And I'm glad it does because it helps me to know that I'm not alone. It helps me to feel like I'm in good company because uh, all every man in his best state is altogether vanity. Have you ever noticed the superlatives in that verse? Every man, not just most men, but every man. Not at his worst, but he's talking about man dressed in his finest good of eating clothes, his finest three-piece suit, at his best state. He's talking about man at his most brilliant, at the zenith of his career, at his most talented. He's talking about man at his most good-looking, before he gets wrinkles and before his voice starts to croak and before his hair turns gray or turns loose. He's talking about people at their best, at the height of their talents and abilities, every man at his best state is altogether. Not somewhat, not 90%, not 95%, not even 99.8%, but at altogether, 100%, through and through, vanity. Now that's the message of the Bible. The Bible does not flatter human pride. It does not <coughs> prop up the ego of man. The Bible does not say, oh, you're a good person, but the Bible says you're a hell-deserving sinner. You're standing before God in filthy garments. I have been in public before when I dropped uh, some food maybe on my tie or on my shirt, tried to rinse it off, and but yet there was this spot there, and every time I would go up and speak to somebody, you could see their eyes go down to that spot. You know, and I'm, like, oh, I'm exposed to the world, and it's embarrassing. To have on dirty clothes, isn't it? It's embarrassing, especially if you're in the presence of royalty. If you're in the presence, if you're at some important occasion, if you're at a maybe a banquet or a ball, it'd be one thing to have dirty clothes if you're out planting shrubs in the backyard. It's another thing when you go to a meeting and your clothes are dirty. You want to make sure that you're clean. Most people do anyway. Joshua the high priest is standing on trial before the Lord, and he's dressed in filthy garments. This is a picture of you <coughs> and my depravity. You say, Brother Mike, what are those filthy garments? That, the, that they are our unrighteousness. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We all are as an unclean thing. We all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have carried us away. It tells us that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. You're not in a tuxedo or in a beautiful evening gown with costly jewelry and bedecked with all sorts of the uh, amenities that make people beautiful this day and age. No, my friends, you're standing before the angel of the Lord dressed in filthy rags. All of our righteousnesses, all of our good deeds are right, are filthy rags. Isn't that what he's saying there? All of our best deeds are unfit to presents before God. I like something Elder Harold Hunt said this week, and he said, even my prayers need praying for. You ever felt like that? That even your holiest deeds need atoning for? That you need the blood of Christ to cover you? You know, even my sermons are imperfect. Uh, they're, they're unworthy of the God that I seek to proclaim. And I have to pray, O oh Lord, forgive the sins of the one who speaks. For they are many. Cleanse me and make me a vessel fit for the master's use. I sometimes wish I had this vessel in an angelic body. 
so that my voice wouldn't crack and my mind wouldn't wander and I would be able to say everything just right and preach it like it really deserves to be preached. But instead we have this treasure in earthen vessels, in human bodies. And I get tired and my mind wanders and my voice cracks and my and sometimes I, I mispronounce words and my sentences are not grammatically correct. And sometimes that seems to me so much less than the Lord deserves. He deserves better than I give him. And he deserves better than you give him. But it is a fact, dear friends, that it's the way that he's made it. He's, it's the pattern that he's given us to worship him. We have this treasure in earth and vessels so that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of us. So that when a man preaches, you would... You and I must say, that's the Lord's doing. Because I know Brother, I've heard Brother Mike, but he couldn't preach his way out of a paper sack. Thank God that he was blessed today to feed our soul. You know, when you're listening to a sermon and you quit looking at the man, as it were, you, you can't see him, you're not thinking about him anymore, but you're so engaged in what he's saying that you can see the picture. You can, you can follow what he's saying. That's when the Lord is blessed. That's when the Lord's blessed. When the man gets out of the way. I like it when that happens. I like it when I'm preaching and I forget about myself. And I can just preach the truth and I don't care what anybody thinks, but it's the picture that we're concentrating on. You see, our holiest moments are besmirched and marred by sin. Joshua the high priest is clothed with filthy garments. So we have a frightening prospect. Judgment is coming and we are not fit to stand before God dressed in our own righteousnesses. That sounds like a pretty ominous story, preacher, but I want you to notice point number three. Verse four. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments. Joshua is standing before the angel of the Lord, and the Lord says, Take away the filthy garments from him, for behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. But what did Joshua do to deserve this? Nothing. Did Joshua ask for it? No. This is a gift of grace. This is a free gift. It's a gift that God purposed, that the judge purposed to bestow. Joshua did not deserve it. He didn't earn it. But it's the Lord's own initiative. That's what grace is. It's, grace is not that you move toward God and say, Oh Lord, would you do something for me, please? I beg you. But grace is God making the decision, taking the initiative, taking the first step, and moving toward you when you were dead in trespasses and in sins. By nature, we're clothed with filthy garments and we face a very ominous prospect. We have to stand before God in judgment. But here's the gracious provision that God has made. Take away the filthy garments from him, for behold, I have caused his iniquity to pass, and I will clothe him with change of raiment. You know what this is teaching? This is teaching the great doctrine of justification by the blood of Jesus Christ. The word justification is a technical term. You read, a, you read it primarily in the New Testament, in the epistles of Paul. Justification is a courtroom expression. And when you hear it, I hope you will remember this picture in your mind of a judge pronouncing the verdict of not guilty. That's what justification is. Justification is the picture of a judge pronouncing the verdict of not guilty. When a person stands before a judge, he can pronounce one of two verdicts. He can either say guilty and your sentence to death or sentenced to a life in prison or he can say not guilty you can go free justification is the not guilty part of that verdict and the new testament tells us that justification is a gift of god's grace did you know you don't earn justification it's not that god says oh okay well i you let's see you presented a pretty good case for yourself joshua might have said you see lord let me explain the reason I'm here in filthy garments. I'm here in filthy garments because I, I started out from home in clean clothes, but I stumbled along the way. And my, I, I, I got a dirt on my clothes, 
And then I was in an accident and my garments were ripped and tattered and torn. And uh, Lord, I went a little bit further and um, someone else uh, uh, spilled a drink and it fell on my clothes. And all of these spots and blemishes and all of these tears and tatters and this filth all over me is, is uh, really not my fault. Joshua might have said, that's my case. And the Lord might have said, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. You're, you're, you can go for it. You're not guilty. But you see, these garments, these filthy garments, my friends, are your fault. And they are my fault. They represent the sins that Joshua had committed in his life and the sins that you have committed in your life. Now, I don't know your sins. I don't even know all of my own. In fact, I don't think that we really can get a clear glimpse of how sinful we are. Isaiah saw just a little smattering of that fact in Isaiah chapter 6, and he cried out, woe is me. I, what that means in simple terms is, uh, I've had it. <laughs> I'm done for. I'm in trouble now. Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of uncleanness. He saw the holiness of God, and in contrast to how holy God is, Isaiah said, Woe is me. A pox upon me. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm in trouble. He, I, I think if you could see the exceeding sinfulness of sin in your life, how God sees it, that you would be horrified. I would be horrified if I could see it. I know some of the lies I've told. And I see how proud I've been. I, I know about my, and I know about my covetousness. And I know how much I pamper my flesh. You know, I want to be comfortable and I want to make myself happy. And I, I know how I've mistreated other people before. And I know some of the lustful thoughts that I've had. And I know some of the behavior in my life that I wouldn't admit publicly, but God knows all about it. And I have to tell you, dear friends, that I don't think that I could even answer for the first sin, much less all of them. How about you? Not only the sins of commission, but what about the sins of omission? What about the times I should have done things that I didn't? Have you ever skipped church when you should have been there? You say, oh, that's no big deal. The Bible says that it is. That's a sin. It's wrong to withhold worship from God and glory that's due to Him for ourselves. And because we're too lazy to get out of bed or because we're, we put something else in front of Him. Did you know that's a form of idolatry, isn't it? And it's wrong. It's, a, it's sinful. You say, well, you can't go to hell for doing that. The Bible tells us in James chapter 2 that he that keeps the whole law and yet offends in one point... He's guilty of all. Why is that, preacher? I'm, I'm trying my best. God deserves, and He demands more than your best. He demands perfection. He's perfect. Sin is so, uh, and sin is so antithetical to the nature of God that even one sin cannot live in His presence. Every sin and disobedience will receive a just recompense of reward, says the Bible. You say, well, I've never done anything wrong, preacher. I'm like the rich young ruler. I've, all these things that I kept from my youth up, I've, I've lived a morally upstanding life. The Lord says, one thing thou lackest then. How's your heart? Go and sell everything that you have and give it to the poor. The Lord is testing his heart. Do you love your neighbor more than yourself? Are you willing to liquidate all of your assets and to give everything to people less fortunate than you are? And it says he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. He didn't want to part with his portfolio. See, the message of the Scriptures, God demands you and me to be perfect not only in our hands, but in our hearts. Not only in our manners, but in our motives. Not only in our deeds, but in our desires. God demands you to be perfect on the inside and the out. How many of you measure up to that? Not I. Not I. If that's the case, preacher, judgment's coming. We're all standing in filthy garments. 
There's no help for us. I can't. I can't make a case that the Lord. You got to understand that that lie I told. Uh, it was uh, you. You probably would have done the same thing if you were under the same circumstance. <laughs> no, it's not the case. The fact is, my friends, we are facing a terrible dilemma. But God has graciously provided justifying grace. By His own initiative, the Lord looks at us and He says, take away the filthy garments from Him, give Him a new change of clothes, change of raiment. Because I have caused, I have caused, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from Thee. Who caused it? Not you, not me. We didn't deal with our own sins. It's God who caused it, who has initiated this blessing of pardon and forgiveness for our sins. I don't know of a greater blessing in life than forgiveness for your sins. To think that God would wipe the sweat clean and simply forgive all of your sins and cause your iniquity to pass from thee is it's the best news that sinners have ever heard, isn't it? Justification. Romans 3.24 says, Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You see, when Jesus died on the cross and redeemed us from our sins, it's at that point that God said, Not guilty to you and me. Even though you know you're guilty, yet God said you're not. You say, well, why? Because... The judgment that was due to your sins was poured out on Jesus Christ. The judgment that we were talking about, that is that every man must answer to God for his life, Jesus answered to God for your life. Jesus, in fact, was treated as if he had lived your life. Every thought that you thought, he bore that sin. Every sinful deed that you've committed, every crime in your life, the Lord Jesus, both sins of omission and sins of commission, Jesus bore it all. And through that means He's caused our iniquity to pass from us. Notice the victorious redemption that Jesus has accomplished for us in the second verse in our text. The Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan. Now the judge calls the prosecuting attorney to the bench and he says he says your case is over he says you're kicked out of the courtroom the judge closes court this court is adjourned and he kicks he rebukes the prosecuting attorney and he says you don't have any charges against Joshua anymore for I have caused his iniquity to pass did you know because Jesus died on the cross, dear friends, and when God looks at you and He looks at me and all of His elect people, He doesn't see your sins? And there's nothing there for the devil to accuse you of. Romans chapter 8 says in verse 33, Who, uh, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? For he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him freely, also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It's a question Paul throws out there as a challenge. A universal challenge. Do I have any takers? Anybody out there that would lay a charge against God's elect? The devil might say, I have something I can say about Mike Goins. I, knew, I saw that time back in 1974. I know exactly what he's like. The devil might say, but he says, no one can lay anything against the charge of God's elect, for it is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also make of intercession for us. Notice the comfort of God's elect, God's people, is in the fact that Jesus paid your penalty. He died in your stead. He lives now and intercedes on your behalf. And He has perfectly satisfied the law of God in the stead of every one of His people. That's the gospel, my beloved. That's the gospel of grace. That's the picture here in Zechariah chapter 3. 
He said, the Lord rebuked thee, O Satan. When Jesus died on the cross, he defeated the devil. You say, well, the devil doesn't seem to be defeated. I, he fathers me every day. He's, a, he's a, a vicious and relentless foe. But the good news is that the devil has been decapitated. There's an interesting verse in the third chapter of Habakkuk, the 13th verse that says, Thou, dis thou woundest the head out of the house of the wicked by, listen, by discovering the foundation unto the neck. Now he's talking about a head, a neck, and a foundation. And the foundation is discovered. What does discover mean? To take off the cover. <coughs> the foundation, the body is and the covering of the body is taken off at the neck. That's simply a way of saying he cut his head off. <laughs> cut his head off. Isn't it? And who did he cut the head, the head of the house of the wicked? That's the devil. The devil, the serpent, has been, has been wounded in his head. That was the first promise and prophecy of the Bible, Genesis 3.15, that the woman's seed would bruise the serpent's head and the serpent would bruise his heel. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather have your heel injured or your head injured? I don't want an injury in anywhere, but if you have your choice, would you rather be injured in your heel or your head? Would you ever rather have a, a, a severe blow to your foot or to your cranium? Obviously, the blow to the foot would be a lot less life threatening, right? A blow to the head could mean your death. Well, Jesus would be wounded in his heel. The serpent would wound his heel. That talks about the sufferings of Christ. When he was wore the crown of thorns, when he was pierced with the nails in his hands and his feet, when the sword thrust into his side, when he was spat upon and ridiculed and he suffered and he was in agony, the serpent was wounding his heel. But you know, it was through that process that Christ wounded the old serpent's head. And the best way to kill a snake is to hit it right in the head, right? Jesus killed that snake. The serpent was wounded in his head. He cut his head off. That's why 1 John 3 8 says that for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hebrews 2.14 says uh, about this one who became us. He took not into the nature of angels, but the seed of Abraham, that he might be made in all points like unto his brethren. It says there that he came to deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. And it says he came to destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. John 12, 31 says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now is the prince of this world cast out. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. When Jesus was crucified on the cross, he judged the prince of this world. Revelation 12, verse 10 says that the, uh, that the devil, the old serpent, was cast down when Jesus Christ was crucified. The Lamb of God. Over and again, he rebuked the devil. The devil might be able to make your life miserable in this world, but dear friends, the good news of the gospel is he can never take away your eternal life that Jesus Christ has won for you on Calvary's rugged cross. Isn't that good news? Here's a picture of grace. Joshua is on trial. He's dressed in dirty clothes. The devil is ready to charge him, but the Lord says, give him a new suit of clothes. He says, change his raiment. I've forgiven his sins. Devil, you're out here. The Lord rebuke thee. The court is adjourned. He says, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, the covenant God, the God who made a covenant with his people before in, in times past, he's the one who rebukes you on the basis of that covenant. Of redemption is not this a brand the Lord says this to the devil about Joshua is not this a brand plucked out of the fire and I dare say there's not a better way to describe you and me this morning than that we are bland brands brands we are brands plucked from the fire the Lord has reached down his own hand into the fires of hell as it were and lifted you and me out 
I deserve judgment. I deserved eternal punishment. You deserved the fires of eternal ruin. But you are a brand plucked from the burnings of eternal judgment. I don't enjoy preaching about hell. <laughs> a lot of people do. A lot of people, that's the main message they preach. People come to church and almost every Sunday they hear about hell. They hear that you better run while you can. You better get while the getting's good. <laughs> better make your decision before it's everlastingly too late. No, I don't preach about hell to scare people. Because I believe that your eternal destiny is not a matter that depends upon the choice you make. It's the choice of God that determines your eternal salvation. He chose a people before the foundation of the world. He loved them. Christ died for them. He's done the work. That's what grace is all about. But I do preach about hell from time to time to remind God's children what they've been saved from. First Thessalonians chapter 1 says that Jesus Christ came to deliver us from so great a death. He came to deliver us from eternal punishment. We're to wait for His Son from, uh, from heaven, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. There's a wrath to come, but He's delivered us from it. He's plucked us as brands out of the fire. Isn't that good news? And then I want you to notice, after this frightening prospect of judgment and this serious problem of depravity and this gracious provision of justification and victory over the devil, the Lord says, let them set a fair miter upon Joshua's head, crown him as a king. Did you know the Lord has made you personally one of a king and a priest? He's, he's made a change in your life. He, legally, He justified us on the cross, but finally, He makes a change in our lives, so they, a personal change in the work of regeneration. He comes and lives inside of our hearts. I want to tell you, when the Lord's inside of your heart, Dear friends, when He's living on the inside of you, there's something in there that you that you know is there. You know, you don't have to convince them, an expectant mother that she has a baby growing inside her womb. She knows it's there and she loves that child. Now, she may not know exactly what the child looks like, but that, especially at the first moment of, of movement, that the mother, I'll tell you, she's in love. And she's protecting that. And I'm telling you to have the Lord living in your heart. You know He's there. That's why when you do wrong, you can't just get away from it. That's why there's something on the inside of you that you feel like, oh, I've offended the guest that lives, that divine resident of my soul. And you want to try to keep a clean house, don't you, for the Lord. May you and I keep our bodies pure and clean because you have a divine guest living. And the Lord says... Let them set a fair reminder upon his head. Here's Joshua the high priest who looked like a beggar in rags. And now he looks like a king with fresh clean clothes and a crown upon his head. Isn't it amazing that the Lord would treat little worms like us as kings? Crown worms. <laughs> Get that image in your mind. Little earthworm crawling with a crown on his head. A crown worm. Did you know that's what you and I are? Crown words. Sinners, just miserable, weak, helpless sinners in and of ourselves. But the Lord has given us the royal treatment and made us as kings and priests unto our God so that we can go to Him in prayer and we will reign with Him. In fact, we may even reign with Him from time to time in this world. There are times when, as it were, we're on top of the world. We're in the kingdom of God. We're being treated with the royal bounties of the kingdom of God. Now then He says finally, and the angel of the Lord said unto Joshua, verse 7, If thou wilt walk in my ways. Notice what the Lord's done for him. Now he gives him a charge. The Lord has changed his garments. The Lord has cleaned him up. The Lord has crowned him as a king. The Lord has, has uh, kicked the prosecutor out of the courtroom. It's the Lord who's forgiven his iniquity. God has done all of this for Joshua. Now in response to to the gifts of grace, the Lord says to Joshua in verse 7, If thou wilt walk in my ways and will keep my charge, 
then thou shalt also judge my house. Notice the if-then statement in this text. If you will do this, then I will do this. This is a conditional promise. And he's not saying you need to do this in order to get your sins forgiven. The sins have already been forgiven earlier in the chapter. He's not saying you need to do this in order for me to defeat the devil. The Lord's already done that by His sovereign grace. He says, uh, in response to the gifts that I've given you, I want you to live right. I want you to walk in my ways. I want you to be obedient to me. I want you to keep my charge. I want you to do what I said. And when you do that, you will have places to walk among those that stand by. You will have fellowship with God's people. And you will have blessings in God's house. I want to tell you, dear friends, we ought to serve Him today. You say, well, preacher, what you're telling me is my home in heaven is already a settled fact, so I can just live however I want to in this world. You haven't really understood what I'm saying then. What I'm saying is that He's done for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He's given you the best gift, gift that anyone has ever had. And in response... To his goodness in gratitude for his grace you and I should live obedient lives walking in his ways and when we do so there will be more blessings to be enjoyed on top of that what we have in Zechariah chapter 3 is the gospel in miniature a picture of grace you ever wondered what the preacher meant when he said I believe we, we believe in salvation by grace and some of the older folks said, Amen, Amen. And you were a younger person listening to that, and you thought, what does he mean? Here's what, I, what he means. I've tried to picture it for you this morning. I admit that we're all guilty sinners before God, and we can't help ourselves. But he's done for us something that we couldn't do for ourselves. And he solved a problem that we had that we could never have solved, and in response to that, we should live lives serving him and praising him for his goodness to us. What a wonderful chapter in Zechariah chapter 3. And perhaps this chapter describes your story. You feel to be Joshua, the high priest, tattered and torn and dressed both in your filthy rags before God, but yet your hope is in His mercy. Your hope is in His decree before the foundation of the world that, he, that you are one of His. Your hope is in His pardoning grace. His victorious redemption, His justification through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I say you ought to take up your cross and be baptized. You ought to cast your lot with the people to whom this message is good news. You ought to live with those and walk among those that stand by who also were in this same plight and who sing the same song. Yes, my beloved, you ought to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and obedience. We bid you to do so this morning as we publish an open door to the church and sing a closing hymn. Turn to hymn number 154. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound is. We stand to sing, we will publish an open door to the church. <laughs>